was a weird start time and end time. The reason for that is this class was originally a four credit hour class. It was then switched to a three credit hour class. And because of that, um, the weird starting and ending time still stayed into effect, but um, we're going to adjust the times a little bit to reflect for it. A, a three credit hour class is a 50 minute lecture and a 50 minute lab. So what I'm going to do for this is install Android Studio in here. And I don't know how that is going to perform, but at the very least, we can do most of what I intended to do. While that is downloading, we will look at sort of the housekeeping for this class and go over some very basic stuff. Assume you're all familiar with Canvas. If anyone's not familiar with Canvas, then um, you can talk to me and we can we can go over it. Let me take attendance. and Joe Casura. All right. And Garrett. Okay. Um, most of the stuff for this class will be on the modules section of the course. There is a module 
um, each week. All right. Um, and in that, you'll see the recordings of the class, the videos of the class. You'll also see the homework assignments and any other handouts uh, that I have. So most of the stuff is structured around weekly modules. In this week's module, I have a fair use guideline handout, which is a little less relevant for this class, but I include it anyhow. What this relates to is the use of copyrighted material in your school projects. Um, you have greater flexibility for using copyrighted material um, in school projects as compared to out there in the real world. So, for example, if you had a sporting goods store and you wanted to show a picture from the Cleveland Browns web website, strictly speaking, that would be violating copyright law if you did that. All right. Uh, however, if you were in a web development class um, for me, you would be allowed to use that as long as you gave credit. So the bottom line is, is mainly we'll be talking about images. Um, if you use images from somewhere on the web, give credit somewhere within your application. Okay, that's pretty much um, the, the rule as far as that goes. Let me start installing this. Your first homework assignment is easy. Um, I just want to make sure you can get around Android Studio. So, what I want you to do is I want you to open the tip calculator app, and we'll show you how to do that, and just get some screen prints for me. All right, so really this is just about navigating through Android Studio, because we just want to make sure you can get, you have it installed on your machine, or if you want to wait uh, until Thursday when it's installed on the machines in lab, that's fine as well. But I just want to make sure that you have it installed, and you can look at it, and uh, um, you can navigate through it and do all the stuff that you need to. Oh, Android Studio is already in, uh, installed here. Excellent. I did not realize that. Cool. So that's your first assignment. Essentially, install Android Studio and get some screen prints of an application that I have that you can download. And we'll be talking about that application in class as well. All right, probably not today, but uh, possibly today or definitely uh, on Thursday. All right, so the stuff, most of the stuff is in the modules. There'll be a module for each week. Any handouts that I have, any examples that I cover in class. Uh, some students tell me that sometimes it's hard to read the screen when I lecture. Uh, in the videos, and I recognize that, uh, but I do give you the uh, code example so that you can look at them and review them that way. All right, uh, let's review the syllabus. Okay, cool. <clears throat> it says CISS 264. It's 265. It's actually CISS 264. When we changed the credit uh, hours, we had to change the number. And I forgot to change my syllabus. The first part of the syllabus covers a lot of different ways that you can contact me. All right, You can contact me uh, by phone, which is probably the least effective way to contact me. It's better to contact me via email, um, either through Canvas or through LC's email. My office hours uh, will be determined sometime this week. I'll come up with what my office hours are. Or you can also schedule them by appointment. Um, office hours simply means that I'm available um, in my office to answer any questions or any additional difficulties that you have. <coughs> you can make appointments to come in if that doesn't work. You are also welcome to come and sit in on any of my other labs. All right, I have two labs on Monday and Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, and then two labs on Tuesday and Thursday. So I have one other lab on Tuesday and Thursday, and one lab on two labs on Monday and Wednesday. So you can come in and sit on those labs. Uh, they're not for this class, but for other classes, and you can ask any questions that you have um, about the material. I can Skype with you. I can discuss via phone. Uh, I could, we can go on online chat within Canvas. Um, there's a lot of different ways that I can that you can get a hold of me to discuss it. Therefore, 
Uh, I'm trying to make myself as available as possible. If you run into questions that you can ask them, that I can give you an answer quickly. All right. Um, that is key, uh, in my opinion, in most classes. It's not let yourself get too stuck, but instead ask questions when you're just starting to get confused, as opposed to when you've gone a week and are totally confused about something. All right. It's a real small class, right? Um, therefore, if any one of you has a question, that would be 20% of the class. All right. So by all means, ask. You know, we, 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 uh, an advantage of the small class is I can take more time to uh, sort of address individual needs. You can also talk to me in, during the lab time um, if you want. Um, okay. Um, here's a description of the class. This is what we publish in our catalog uh, and all that. Instructor's approach, this is your class. Each of you right now are 20% owners of this class. All right, it's a substantial amount. And therefore, for all the reasons I gave, it's important that you understand what I'm going over. It doesn't do me any good to cover the material just for the sake of covering it. I want to make sure that we cover it and that you really understand it. So therefore, um, it's important that you, um, that, that you understand it. So if you have questions, then ask. Canvas will be used in this class exclusively. So for any announcements or uh, relating to, you know, if I happen not to be here on a particular day, or if someone asks me a question I don't know the answer for and I find the answer, I'll publish it on Canvas and I'll, I'll publish an announcement saying that here's the answer or something along those lines. So it would be a good idea to check Canvas a couple times a week, you know. Check it between classes, check it. You know, check it between the Tuesday and Thursday class. Check it sometime over the weekend uh, just to see. There are a number of college policies that you should be aware of. They're fully documented in the catalog, but they're mentioned here. My policy on late work. I'm very flexible as far as late work, provided that um, I, I understand that you're actually working on the stuff and that you just haven't disappeared. So if you're in lab, if you're asking me questions, and uh, I understand that you're working on it, I don't have a problem with you turning in something late. I know you're working on it, and if you miss a deadline, that's not the end of the world, all right? Uh, if, however, you simply disappear and at the end of the semester turn in lab one, which happens, all right, then, you know, I'm going to take points off. It's all, it's all a matter of keeping the dialogue open and meeting me halfway. If you run into a personal situation, if, for example, you're ill or you have a family emergency or something like that, you need to miss a class or two and you're a little bit behind, just let me know. You don't have to let me know anything you don't want me to know, so you don't have to go into details if it's private uh, information. But just tell me that you're going to be, you're gonna be uh, late and you're going to be missing an assignment and you'll turn it in by a certain time. And then stick to it. All right? If you do that, then we'll be fine as far as grades go. Right, just keep the dialogue open. If there's something that you're going to be late about, let me know. Talk to me about it. By all means, ask any questions if you don't know. If you are not sure about something, um, send the question via email. Don't submit the assignment halfway done and include a question. All right. The assumption is that anything that you submit to the Dropbox, I, I assume, is done and is, is as correct as you think it is. If there's something that you still have questions about, you should be emailing me and not sending it to the Dropbox. Um, all right. Um, the one thing I will say, though, is if you continue to be late on assignments week after week after week, and especially if you start getting further and further behind, then that's a warning sign that something needs to change. Maybe you need to spend more time. Uh, on the class, maybe you need to come and talk to me and set up times to come and ask me questions during my other lab sessions or so on. But the bottom line is something needs to change. All right, so a single late assignment, no big deal. Continual late assignments, especially if they're getting progressively later, then there's a problem that we need to address and talk to me about it and we'll figure out a solution. Um, there was a student last semester who did a great job bringing to my attention the fact that they were running into problems. 
And the cool thing was, um, I, I, I wish you, I wish I, I could like bring him into all my classes to have him talk about it. But essentially, what he did is he didn't wait till he was too far behind. He was struggling with an assignment, really struggling with it. All right, but he talked to me. We discussed a way to solve it because he just wasn't getting some things. We discussed how to how to solve it. Um, he came in during my one other lab. Uh, he made a commitment to come a certain number of times per week uh, to, to the lab, and we worked through it. He ended up to getting a good grade in the class and doing a really good job on the final project. So, you know, he really uh, noticed that there was a problem, didn't wait too long, made a commitment to spend a little bit more time working with me on it, and we were able to get through it. So, um, you know, if you do that, you'll, you'll be in good shape. Final grade will be based on, uh, I made a math error here. It says two quizzes worth 10 points, 70 points worth of homework assignments, and 20 points for, that should be 10 points for the final, because it adds up to 110%. Should add up to 110, it should add up to 100 points. So two quizzes, each worth 10 points. Oh, no, that's, I'm mistaken. The two quizzes are each worth five points. That's right. And then the final's worth 10, uh, 20 points. Quizzes and the final are not meant to be intimidating or difficult. They ask questions that um, I can't tell from your programming. I can tell from your programming if you did something right, but I can't tell from your programming if you know why that you do something a certain way. And I think it's important to know the whys as well. All right. Here is uh, a list of the schedule um, with uh, the stuff that uh, I plan on covering. I trust that you review this on your own time and, and, and read all the details uh, for it. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about uh, the mobile environment. Yes, question? Okay. All right. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the mobile environment so that we understand how this class fits in with the entire mobile world. All right. is likely to have a presence on mobile devices one of two different ways. And in reality, they should cover both bases. So they, this isn't a one or the other. It's a probably both. And that is mobile web and apps. What's the difference between a mobile website and a app. A mobile website would be you go on your phone's web browser, say you go to Wikipedia, it's picked up with the PDF format, it's look better on your phone screen. Whereas an application would be something you get from the, like your phone of choices uh, app store. Exactly. A couple things are different. First of all, Typically, to visit a mobile website, um, no special software is required other than a web browser, which any mobile device is going to have, uh, any smartphone is going to have, all right? Even older phones will have it, all right? My old flip phone, I could browse the web on, all right? That wasn't necessarily a great experience, but I could do it, 
all right? So a mobile website only requires, that requires typically no special software, just a web browser. It's simply a website that's written with the restrictions and the mobile environment in mind, all right? Which means that typically is optimized, which usually translates to a simpler layout. Um, many times websites have multiple columns. Typically mobile websites will just have a single column. All right. Um, and we have a class devoted to that. We, taught, we touch on it in CISS 216, the intro to web development, but we also have a class devoted to all the different techniques that you can do when creating your website to get an optimal experience in a mobile environment. Um, with an app, you actually install something. You actually download and install something, all right? Um, apps are actually, there's actually different versions per platform. In other words, you're going to have an iOS version, you're going to have an Android version of it, all right? So the apps are sometimes called native apps because they, they have to be written in the format specific to a particular machine. Whereas Android versus iPhone, there should be no difference in, theoretically, anyhow, there should be no difference in accessing a, a mobile website, a website that's optimized. When I say mobile website, I'm really just talking about any website, right? Because you can pull up any website on your phone. But when I designate mobile website, I mean that some steps have been taken to make sure that it works in a mobile context. There's a number of things that you can do. You can apply different style sheets if you're on a mobile device versus on a desktop to make it look different. You could have, for example, on a desktop machine, you could have a multiple column. You could style the, the HTML to have multiple columns, whereas on a mobile device, you could have just a single column. You could uh, eliminate certain images on a mobile device with the thought of, you know, the mobile device uh, typically is going to be a little bit slower. Um, you want a simpler layout and so on. All right. Uh, you can actually have two versions of the, of the website and have uh, sort of a traffic cop on the web server direct the person to the right version uh, of, of the page. When you mention m.wikipedia.com, a typical user will go to www.wikipedia.com. That is the version for a desktop machine. Um, and if you're a mobile user going to it, you'll automatically be redirected to m.wikipedia.com, which has a typically uh, a simpler layout and so on and so forth. So you can take any of those approaches. You can sort of have a one-size-fit-all website that, that hopefully works well in all environments. You can do things by styling and even some scripting to make sure that the two different web pages work in both environments. Or you can actually have two totally different websites. And all of those strategies are appropriate depending on the particular uh, circumstances that you're in. Um, it seems to me what I'm seeing more and more of is people doing cool stuff with CSS to format their websites in a way. In fact, I notice a lot of desktop websites starting to look like mobile websites with the assumption that people are, you know, it's a nice clean layout anyhow. It's just on a desktop machine, it's just bigger. And maybe they do some enhancements to it. All right. With a mobile app, you're going to have two literally different applications developed. You have to take that approach. You don't have the one-size-fit-all option. Now, there's ways to generate two different applications where you keep a consistent code base, but that's another story. All right. You literally have two different applications, an Android and a, uh, uh, an iOS. Um, what are some advantages of an app over a mobile website? Yeah, an app typically, and again, this is sort of the funny thing because I'm going to talk in typical terms, but, you know, sort of the line between them are sort of blending a little bit or, or, or blurring. But typically, you can offer better uh, offline in an app if you're not connected to the web. Typically, websites require you to be connected to the web unless you take some special sort of uh, steps, coding-wise. What's another advantage of mobile to a mobile app as compared to a website? Faster. Can be faster, all right, because you're not traveling through the internet. Uh, the code's already there. Another big advantage is it can more easily 
take advantage of all the features of the mobile platform that you're on. So integrating with things like your contact list, your phone, uh, well, not, I guess your phone, but, but uh, your, your camera uh, is what I meant to say. Uh, other apps and other hardware things on your phone, an accelerometer, for example. Um, all those things typically um, are going to, since the, the, the apps are written specifically for a platform, you get better integration between your, 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 your application and all the different hardware and other components of the, 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 the mobile device. Um, as far as updating goes, apps need to be updated. Now, apps can be configured to update automatically, that's true, but the website, that's never an issue. You know, you go to Wikipedia right now, you know that you have the most up-to-date version of Wikipedia. Of course, you have to be connected to the web to do that, all right? But there's no worry about, am I getting the right version or something like that. Whereas it's possible with a mobile app, the way that it's set up, that it might not have updated and might not have given you the, the newest version yet. Although, again, it can be set up to update automatically. My phone's always telling me that it updated something, all right? Uh, but again, um, it, uh, you know, uh, there is a problem that it does actually have, that update does actually have to happen. And there could be circumstances that could keep it from happening. For example, if you are not on a, 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 a network, you uh, might not want to update applications that way because uh, just it uses your data and it slows it down and so on. All right. The point is that there's advantages that both of these offer. All right. In a nutshell, the web, mobile websites offer the advantage that um, doesn't really require you to do a lot. You just have to have a web browser. So from the user's perspective, have a web browser be connected to the web, boom, you can use them. The apps have the advantages that they can be custom to the device and therefore can take advantage to all the characteristics of the device. All right can do some things offline, can integrate with other parts of the device, hardware and component-wise. That's it in a nutshell. All right, what I want to do now is I want to tour a Android application. And we're just going to look at the whole Hello World application. We're going to create it, and we're going to look at it, and we're going to see, because I want to sort of take a tour to point out different parts of the application. All right, because uh, the one thing that is that is potentially confusing about this, and we do it for a reason. It's not like we do this in a confusing way just for the fun of it. All right, but there's a lot of components that have to work together even for a simple app. All right, for a simple app like a Hello World, typically if you think of writing that in Java, and if you're taking my Java class now, all right, the Hello World is like five lines of code. And, and some comments, all right? Whereas the Hello World app here, we actually have probably you know, half dozen, dozen files. <laughs> you know, it's crazy, really. But each of those components does a, a, a distinct job, and it's important for us to know what each one of them do. So that's what I aim to do today, is to take a little tour of Visual Studio, uh, um, Visual Studio, Android Studio, uh, take a tour of Android Studio, look at the parts of an Android application, and then next time um, we will look at um, um, a, a little more involved application, more than the Hello World. So I'm going to go and create the Hello World application. Here's 
going to go up to file. It's loading some kind of default application. I don't know what's going on here, but we'll get rid of it. I go up to say file, new. Oops. It will ask us what kind of project we want to create versus asking us for a, um, a name for the application. And it's asking us for a domain uh, for the company. Then it's asking us where we want to put it. All right. Application, I'm going to say CISS264 first app. Company domain. This is used in creating Java packages. All right. Um, we talk about Java in this class, um, and uh, packages are, are typically identified by the URL of, uh, of an organization. So you can just leave the default, whatever that happens to be, or you can put in some URL. If you have a website, you can put the URL, or you can use lorraineccc.edu. And that will simply use that in creating the packages uh, for the code here. Project location, I'm going to put it on the desktop. create a directory called uh, desktop CISS264 first. I hit next. Now it's going to ask us um, the kind of application that we want to develop. Do we want to uh, develop a wearable application, uh, a TV application, Android? Typically we're going to pick phone and tablet. The minimum SDK that it's going to require, and by default it picks uh, Android 4.0.3. The lower you make this, the more devices you allow, but the less features you have. So you can pick any number of different versions of Android to be the lowest ones. According to this, by targeting API 15%, uh, 15 or, or later, your app will run on approximately 100% of the devices that are active on the Google Play Store. Well, 100% is a pretty good percent, all right? So we don't really need to worry about anything lower than 15. All right, click Next. Oh, ask us what kind of application we want to develop. And right now, we're going to do an empty activity. Um, these are all sort of templates for other sorts of activities. Um, we're just going to do an empty one because we want a very simple layout. Alright, next. It's asking us for the name of our activity. Think of an activity as being a screen that's presented to the user wanting you to do something. Alright, and it'll ask you for a name for your layout file. And the name that is generated is activity underscore main, but you can change either of these if you want. There's really no reason to change them, so I'm going to click finish. And what this will do is this will create a whole bunch of files, all right? And we'll go and we'll take a look at the files that we're going to use, that we're going to work on, because some of the files it creates, we don't necessarily go in and manipulate them too often. They're generated uh, and they're used, but uh, we're not going to uh, worry about them too much. So I'm going to click Finish. It goes, it does its thing. If we go and look out on the desktop, there is our... There's a whole bunch of directories and other files, control files. All right. Now, still going and doing its thing. So I can't run the app yet. Run is disabled. 
I'm going to see if it will let me run it in a reasonable amount of time. All right. This is what really caused the hold up in when I tested this in BU 212. It I, it went 10 minutes and still hadn't run the app yet, so we we couldn't use that. Um, Well, I can do in the meantime, I think, is we can start looking at some of the files. Maybe not. Okay. Gradle scripts relate to the process of compiling it. We're not really going to deal much with that. If I expand, I have two folders that are immediately going to be of interest, the Java and the RES. All right, I can expand the Java and I can see main activity. Remember, that's what we said the main activity was called, main activity. RES are all the resource files. So we'll look through these resource files um, one at a time. This main activity is a Java class. Notice it says main activity Java. And this is where our Java code lives for this activity. All right, there's not much in here, of course, because all we're doing is uh, um, creating a screen that pops up and says hello. All right. So we'll look at this at the end of the process, all right, but just to identify it. Uh, now, under resources, we have first of all a layout, an MIP map, and a bunch of values. And the values are stored in XML files. We're going to look at um, the layout and the strings XML files. The other files we'll leave until later. I'll identify them, but I, I won't really um, go into detail. This IC launcher PNG is for different screen densities versions of the launcher icon. When you download and install a app, you get a little icon associated with it. Well, different devices have different screen densities. And if they all use the same icon file on a screen that had a very high density, the icon file would look tiny. And on a screen that had a very low icon density, uh, or a uh, 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 pixel density, it would look uh, gigantic. So the way Android gets around that is by giving you different versions of the icon for different screen densities. Note this is not screen size. This is screen density, how densely packed the pixels are together. All right? Because if there's a big space between each pixel, 10 pixels is going to take up a lot of spaces. If they're very dense, then 10 pixels is going to take up only a little bit of space. So. That's the difference between these different icons. We will do that with all our images. We'll have different versions of the images depending on, or let me, let me rephrase that. We have the ability to do that for all our images, to have different versions of an image depending on the um, screen density. All right. Colors and styles deal with uh, the appearance of the page. We can set certain parameters about the appearance of the page and we can control the way it looks. We're going to look first of all at the layout file. The layout file you can view one of two different ways. This is similar to Visual Studio. You can view it in sort of a graphical way where you see a picture of it, or you can view the code. I 
I sort of prefer the code view, all right, because the code view really gets down to the nuts and bolts and tells you exactly uh, what you have. In this case, we have, in our XML file, we have a single control, a text view. All right? Think of a text view as being like a label. All right? uh, have, you, have any of you, you've done uh, Visual Studio and C Sharp and stuff. That would be like a label, a text view. So this would be similar to the ASP controls if you've done ASP.NET stuff where you create an ASP control. The difference is, is instead of in an HTML document, this is in an XML document. What is an XML document? Well, it's a document that uses tags to identify different sections and to identify different pieces. So this specifies the kind of layout it is. It's an Android support constraint layout. And it specifies some parameters about it, about the layout. The Android text, in this case, the text for this is the phrase, hello world. So in the resources section, the layout, you have an XML file that will identify the layout of the activity. We have another XML file that only has one entry, and that is for strings. All right? Any sort of string in your application ought to live in the string file. All right? So if you had a form that had name, address, phone number, and you have labels that say that, those should not be hard-coded in the layout file. There should be strings for each one of those. In fact, really, there should be a string for this. There should be a string for the hello world, right? That should actually be contained in a string value. Right now, the only thing that's in there is an app name field. What is the reason of putting all the string, all the values for labels in a string XML file? Why do you think that we do that? Easy to reuse. Easy to reuse? And different languages, exactly. Uh, so let's think of let's think of you know we have the app name. Let's say we display the app name on a dozen different activities, all right? And we call the app name CISS two sixty four first app, all right? What if we decide we want to say first Android app? Well, if we stored it on several different places. We'd have to go back and change it in several different places. If all of those places, however, refer to the string XML file, we only need to change it in one place. And all the places that refer to it will point to that string. It's sort of like declaring a global variable in like other programming languages. You can put these constants, or a constant is probably a better analogy. You can put string constants in this string file and then everywhere that uses it will point to the string file. So if I want to change it, I'll change it everywhere. And that's a good thing, because you don't want to be inconsistent and call something one thing on one screen, one thing on another screen. So that's the immediate advantage of it. Another advantage that might be a little hard to see is the fact of different languages. What if we wanted to have a French version or a Spanish version? All right, um, name, address, phone number. There's different words for that in Spanish and French and other languages, all right? Do we want to have to go and write code to switch between all those different things? Of course not. If we can put, what we can do with these resources is we can add what are called resource qualifiers to them. So I could create a strings file, then create a strings-fr file 
for the value of those strings in French. Or I could create a strings dot dash sp file for the value of those strings in Spanish, and so on and so forth. The nice thing is I don't have to write any code. The Android framework takes care of it. So if I run an app that has a strings.fr file with all French constants, and my phone is set to French, all right, that's one of my settings on an Android device is the language I'm using, it will pick up the strings from that file as opposed to the default English file. All right? So that's something you don't have to do any kind of coding for. All right? The Android framework takes care of telling the Android app which string file to use. Now, we're not doing that right now. We only have the single default file. But by having the strings in that file, it makes it easy to swap out files for different languages. Yes? Will we be doing stuff during the semester uh, to create various uh, resource files? For oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, you know, the nice thing is, is it doesn't really require any coding. You don't have to have if statements that says, if Spanish, then make this label. The framework handles it. It knows the setting of the phone, and it will pick up the proper uh, resource file. Language is just one thing that you can change for resources. You can, you can have different resource files for different um, um, uh, screen sizes. All right, so I could have a different layout file for a gigantic screen and a different layout file for a smaller screen. All right, I could have a different layout file for different languages. Because remember, certain languages, the orientation is um, not left to right, but right to left. So if I'm using one of those languages, I could have the screen laid out the opposite way than the default. So these resource files, although initially are kind of kind of uh, goofy, uh, eventually you'll you'll see the advantage of them. All right. Now to the main activity. Not much code here. This is sort of a standard thing that we have um, in all our applications. And the second line is really the one that says to set the content view for this activity to be this file. And what is that file? In the resources, under layout, it's called activity main. So. That is what makes this activity display this layout. And because this is simply a simple Hello World app, all right, um, that's all it does. It just displays the screen and it looks at you. All right, let's run it because everything has happened. And let's see if it comes up because there's something I want to uh, demonstrate as far as this goes. If I click run, a couple things will happen. First of all, if I had plugged in via USB an actual Android device and that Android device was properly configured, it would show my Android device here. So I could test my application on my device. All right? Um, and we'll, we'll do that at some point in the semester. Oftentimes, though, you don't have the actual device. You, have, you want to use an emulator. Well, right now, we don't have any emulators identified. All right, so I'm going to say to create a new virtual device. And I can go in and I can pick a different setup for a particular device. I'm going to pick a Galaxy Nexus. Running Android version API 25. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I'm just saying for the people that don't want to use the emulator. And sometimes it's good to use the emulator just to test in different 
setups how it's going to look. You know, you may have a specific size phone. You might want to see it looks like it looks like on a tiny phone or a gigantic phone or a tablet. All right, I'm going to start up being in in um, portrait mode. Finish. And I can collect that or, or uh, select that and click OK. And it's going to try to install my application on. It's going to try to start up that device and install my application on it. There it's firing up the emulator. This is what took 10 minutes on the machines in that. It seems to be going a little better. Maybe not. I will test how it runs on the uh, machines in lab um, after they get it installed to make sure that it's an acceptable amount of time. I also will probably bring some Android devices to lab for you to use. This is why I wanted to use my laptop, because this sort of operation on my laptop takes maybe a minute or two, whereas on this I'm not sure if it's ever going to run. One thing that you definitely want to do, even if you do have faster performance than this, is once you have the emulator started up, you want to keep it up. You don't want to close out of it until you're absolutely sure that you're done. See, really, it's just booting the virtual device now. It's not even trying to install the app. So I am not optimistic that this will run quickly. So my hope is by uh, next, by Thursday, I'll have um, the proper stuff so that I can um, display. Um, display my, um, I know... I'm thinking out loud, but I know I have another laptop that it should work for, so I'll try bringing that one in. I can understand this taking a while. This is an intensive process. Essentially, you're, you're having a software emulation of an actual piece of hardware. So I can kind of understand why it's taking so long, but this is a little bit unbearable. Really, all that you would see if it came up is a thingy that has Hello World in the center of it. All right? Um, since this does not look like it's going to cooperate, uh, I guess I'm going to end here. Um, next time, we will go over a little more involved application that has different parts and different pieces, um, uh, uses a string file more, has a more involved layout, and so on and so forth. So we'll review, and that will be the tip calculator application. If you want to play with that beforehand, you are welcome to go and download it um, uh, into Android Studio and, and take a look at it and play with it. All right, any questions? Is anyone going to stay and try to install Android Studio? I already, I already know how. I, uh, I messed with Android Studio a okay. bit over, over the break, and I reset my laptop. So okay. Anyone, so All right. Okay. Um, you 
are definitely encouraged to bring a laptop in to work because typically they will have better performances than our lab machines. Um, but again, I, I want to make sure that um, you know uh, you try, and if you have any issues installing it on a laptop, let me know. All right.